one minute, it will be 1930. Let us drink to the spirit of gallantry and courage that made a strange heaven out of unbelievable hell. And let us drink to the hope that one day this country of ours, which we love so much, will find dignity and greatness and peace again. My name's Irving Lincoln Taylor, and I'm an honest to God, last hired, first fired black man. I'm riding from a train at Woodward Station in the dusty little state of Oklahoma. Of course, I'm not sitting up in the passenger car with all those faces, oh no. I'm hoboing it. I've been hopping into open boxcars, dodging the big bad bull guards hired to mess up us train hoppers all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas, my hometown. It was not easy being raised a black man in the town of Little Rock. Growing up, my life was plagued with racism. Well, I guess I was asking for it. I was born right at the heart of the WKKK. That's the women's Ku Klux Klan. Not all whites are the same out in Arkansas, of course. Many were happy to find me an odd job or two so that I could eat another day. But once the WKKK began tightening its grip on our town, I was without work. I didn't care one bit. There was nothing they could take from a tramp like me who owned nothing, so I continued to denounce their wicked ways. Although it turns out I was wrong. Chiseling me out of a job was not enough, they had to try and kill me. So I hopped onto a train and rode the rails, and from there life was like eggs and coffee for me. I'm considering getting off at some apple in California, and possibly just gambling my way to fortune. I like gambling, because in this world, a white man has a better chance to get a job than a black man, and I don't like that. The odds in life need to be even like they are in crabs, where a white man and a black man have an equal chance at rolling snake eyes. My name is Billie Jean Jackson. It's a family name. I am 18 years of age and I was born and raised in Balco, Oklahoma. I live with Mom, Pa, and my big sister, Marianne. Marianne taught me all I know because Mom and Pa were too busy with a wheat farm to get me an education. It's okay though, Marianne is mighty smart. She likes to learn and she sure likes to teach. When we go to California, like Mom and Pa said, Marianne wants to be a teacher. When I go to California, I want to be one of those movie stars like that gal Shirley Temple. Those movie stars are always glamorous. Their hair is always perfect, their makeup flawless, and their outfits spectacular. Hi, my name is Mary Ann Jackson. I am 21 years old and I am from Balco, Oklahoma. The year is 1932 and our family has had some troubles on our wheat farm. The land has suffered a terrible drought and the soil is eroding. It is so arid and dry that our wheat cannot prosper. But it is the whipping winds and furious dust storms that are the most terrible and dangerous to our farm. I fear my family and I will be downright beat. We will be flat broke. Billie Jean is real swell, the best 18 year old sister any girl could have. I figure it's snazzy that we get along so well because Mom and Pa just told us that we will be sent to the Big Apple of San Francisco, California. Our parents reckon, since Billie Jean and I are in our best years, that we should have the chance to get out while we can. They worry that the land will continue to not do so well and that we won't go bankrupt soon. I find that it is a shame that here my family and I are poor and yet our neighbors have enough money to buy a new tractor for their land. I am sad and sorry to leave my home and my sweet parents, but my sister and I need to make tracks and not look bad. So my parents gave Billie Jean and I each some money for a train ride to San Francisco. Meanwhile, they will stay in Balco and try to make do with the land. They are in their older years and have never known life other than the farm. I fret that they would not make it in the city. Hopefully, Billie Jean and I will fare just fine. We're going on a train to San Francisco, where we will live with our uncle, Samuel. We're still young and can find better lives, better opportunities. Marianne can be a teacher, and I, I can be a movie star. Quite a lot has happened to me since I arrived in San Francisco, California in 1933. 
Back while I was still on the trains in 32, I spent a lot of time with the others who were riding the rails. Some of those other train hoppers were very well informed, telling me about the upcoming presidential election between Mr. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Mr. Herbert Hoover. They kept preaching to me about this FDR character's New Deal. They were telling me that the whole country, not just Arkansas, had low employment rates, and FDR had the plan to put an end to it. They also told me about that no good Hoover. Well, actually they didn't have much to say about it, except that they didn't like it, and neither should I. At one train station, a fellow hobo stole a newspaper from town and had me read it to them. I'm lucky enough to be one of the few literate black men of our day. It said in large bold print, FDR to be next president of the United States. To us, that meant that the depression is going to come to an end very soon. I hopped off the train at San Francisco with skeptically lifted spirits. For near a week, I wandered without direction, looking for a job, but I couldn't find a single employment opportunity. In the end, I settled down in the shanty town on Skid Row, which is what everyone called the part of town where all of us unemployed bums live. Shanty towns were communities of homeless people living in makeshift shacks and the likes. Since there's so many white people in our little shanty town, including one tramp, Sebastian, who I've grown particularly keen to in my travels, I could assume that there's much more at play than racism in regards to my unemployment. But at least in my case, just about everywhere I turn up, I'm openly denied jobs due to the color of my skin. And some racist shopkeepers would chase me off with booms. Sebastian tells me that it's been this way for as long as he could remember. But he also told me about the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NAACP was an organization who sought racial justice and the equal treatment of blacks. There's not much I can do to help their cause, but regardless, I support them in my heart as I gamble the earnings I scrape up each day from panhandling to the horse racing tracks. Slowly but surely, horse racing is being legalized in the state by state, and its outrageous popularity is looking to outdo even boxing. I, for one, have been enjoying the craze, even though I've not made a dime yet. We arrived in San Francisco on January 19, 1933. We met Samuel at his house. He told us a little about his steady career in banking. I asked Samuel how I could get to Hollywood, and he just laughed at me. How could a perfect stranger just laugh at my dreams like that? Samuel is a hard-working type and he is well off, seeing as he owns his own bank. His bank provides a steady income, but our uncle also runs an underground distillery. It was prohibition, so the demand for booze was high and mighty. Our uncle offered us jobs in the secret distillery and we, being the wheats, the new girls who were not used to the city, could not refuse it. At first, it seemed unconventional and unladylike for two young girls to be involved with such a crime as making homebrew hooch, but we had to do what was necessary. We could not just come to California and expect our uncle to do everything for us. We seemed to be getting our feet wet in California. Well, we were getting our feet deep in the wet of the booze. Samuel just didn't have time to juggle his job in the distillery, so it benefited all of us at the time. Marianne and I have written to Pa and Ma often. We were delighted to hear that bankruptcy never hit our family. On the contrary, profits were good enough that our parents were able to buy that tractor they needed. I am a little disappointed that I am not able to see my parents in this thriving state. However, I am so thrilled for them. Work for them was harder with only two pairs of hands and two fatigued bodies. They told us that once they dug it out of the dust, they would be on their way to making money again. Just as things seemed to be going well, on March 5th of 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared a mandatory 100-day bank holiday as part of his New Deal program. Then, four days later, Congress put forth the Emergency Banking Act, which put me out of the business for good. My bank was ruined. I began the search for more work because this illegal alcohol production does not support my family and me enough. What in the world were we to do without his income? To make matters even worse, on July 4th, 1933, Billy Jean and I went out to the store, and when we came back, we found the distillery blown to pieces. As I walk home on July 4th, my distillery was obliterated. My nieces told me that when they got home, they found it like that. My distillery must have exploded. I was panicked. We found that our entire bottle brew had blown the place apart. 
The reason the distillery was Once so profitable was because railroad. of the Prohibition era. Now In 1919, done. President Woodrow right. Wilson passed the 18th and Amendment, which prohibited the sale, purchase, or consumption of alcohol. But that didn't stop anyone. Some people would sell their souls to get their hooch. I can't say I liked working in the distillery. It was the only money our family received at the time. So here we were in California, unemployed, while our family back home in Balco were starting up on the right foot again.